All right. Thank you, Michael Petricone. Thank you, Michael Kratzios. I want to introduce you. I'm exactly. I am Michael Hayes with the Consumer Technology Association. I would like to introduce you to our extraordinary panel of three more Michaels. Um, no, uh, we have we, we have three experts here in, in technology coming from three great diverse backgrounds. Svetlana Matt is on Capitol Hill with Congressman Jerry McNearney. He sits on the Energy and Commerce Committee, which has jurisdiction over many of the issues, including privacy, data security the conversations that really matter in technology right now. We have Barry Williams, the Vice President of Legal and Business Affairs at All Turtles. Barry has had an extraordinary career throughout the technology industry, including at Facebook, StubHub, and a number of other um, roles that lend her an extraordinary perspective as to how we as industry can collaborate with policymakers to tackle some of these challenges that we'll discuss today. And lastly, Lynn Parker. Lynn Parker is a leading expert in artificial intelligence technology with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I'm very much looking forward to learning from Lynn about some of the technicalities of how these challenges that we're going to talk about in AI, how do they technically work? I don't think that we can have an honest conversation about addressing these issues without having a deep understanding about how the technologies themselves are functioning. So with that, I'd like to kick things off. Uh, and I'd like to, to frame this discussion, since we only have a brief moment here, uh, to discuss many of the issues and potentials around artificial intelligence. We're going to focus a lot of our discussion today around bias and diversity issues in artificial intelligence. That way we can really dig into the topic and have some meaningful discussion. Hopefully you all can learn a little bit about how we can move forward with an AI technology that is developed in a way that truly does benefit humanity. But I want to start with that bias question. And what exactly do we mean when we talk about bias in, in artificial intelligence? So Barry, I'd like to start with you on the societal side. When we're talking about bias in artificial intelligence, what do we mean? What's at stake? Who's being affected right now? So when you're speaking about, sorry, I'm, you see me shift. It's this is not made for people who have 36 inch inseams. Oh. <laughs> my knees are like banging. Um, when you're talking about a bias in technology, particularly in AI, you're, you're um, at least from my standpoint, I'm looking at it from marginalized communities. Um, the easiest way that I explain what bias in AI means is explaining it to my eight year old as I say, well, it's essentially opinions that are baked into code. And for him, he can understand that a bit more because my husband is a, is a product manager, so he understands what coding is and that it makes products. But he didn't understand, you know, well, what is, what is bias and how does it get into the product? So, well, that's a bit more complicated. I'll let Lynn explain that, that technical piece. But it's essentially someone taking their opinions and putting them into the code. And the data is only going to be as good as the information that you feed it. So if you are using data sets that have gaps, that don't have information that pertain to women or people of color or people of a certain age, then your data is going to have blind spots and you could be exacerbating a situation that already exists or creating a new one that you weren't aware was actually a problem. And just so that we can illustrate this for people, what are some examples of this? Like, are we living bias in AI right now? Is it affecting people today? Just, yes. <laughs> uh, short, easy answer, yes. Um, I think for me, the probably the easiest example is thinking about it in terms of policing. Mm -hmm. So predictive policing uh, is used by several departments across the nation, and it will tell you how many police you should send to certain neighborhoods at what time uh, and in and, and what particular granular neighborhoods. Now, a lot of that is based on historical crime data. Well, if you already know that historical crime data is targeting black and brown low-income communities, well, if you have now baked that into a system that continually spits out, oh, well, you should go to East Oakland on June 15th, right after the Warriors win another championship, and police that particular area. So it's telling you to go places where historically there may have been crime, but that's also not counting for gentrification. So if you're thinking about it from an historical data set perspective, you're not accounting for any shifts that may have occurred. So you may be sending people in the wrong place, and you haven't necessarily updated your data set to reflect that. 
So Lynn, as we're talking about some of these potentially concerning outcomes um, from a biased AI system, how does that technically work? I mean, walk us through when you're constructing one of these systems, where are the pain points? Where could we theoretically be introducing these problems? That's a great question. A um, lot of reverberation here. Um, so when you're a, a designer of an AI system, um, you have to begin with framing the problem. And so when you frame the problem, the way that you frame it may seem very intuitive to you, but it may lead to some unintended consequences. So let me give you an example. W one of the areas that has a lot of concern for bias is in uh, lending, financial lending. And let's say that you are an AI designer and you want to create a system for financial lending. And so you have to give your AI system an objective. Well, let's say the objective in the context of financial lending is I want to maximize the number of my loans that will get paid back, and that's it. So now that seems reasonable at the highest level, but there's no sense of fairness um, as part of that AI system's algorithm or that AI system's objective. And so right there is one place where you can get unintended consequences. It's just a really quick side note. Uh, I'm a robotics person, and when I teach robotics, um, often I have students try to learn to teach a have a robot learn to follow and explore its environment. The first thing the students will nearly always do is to, and, and do that without running into things. They will give the robot uh, two objectives. One, don't run into anything. Two, cover as much ground as possible. Sounds reasonable. What do the robots do? They spin in place very quickly. <laughs> so that means that what seemed at the highest level to be completely intuitive had an unintended consequence. And this is what's happening with the AI bias in general. We have a high level objective, and then often we can't interpret what those unintended consequences are. The next step is how do we frame the data? What are the attributes of the data that we provide to our system? Um, you know, it may be past credit history, or it may be age, or it may be a zip code of where you live, or it could be a, a whole host of things. And you can imagine, if you're an AI designer, you have thousands of attributes you could choose from. An AI system will not learn well if you have zillions of attributes and not enough data to distinguish between all those attributes. If you have just a few attributes, then it may not be descriptive enough. So there's a design element there. There's an art to designing this system. So you have to pick the right attributes. You may not know which ones are going to lead to the kind of solution you want. And it could be that by, by selecting particular attributes, you are going to lead to some unintended consequence that you didn't imagine up front because it just didn't occur to you. Mm -hmm. So that's another area. And then, of course, we hear a lot about the data, mm -hmm. that the data has to match um, um, the application area. An AI system can only learn based on the data it, see, it sees. And if that data that it learns from is not representative of how the system is used, then the system will not make the right choices. So those are the common areas where technical bias can come into play. Let me just add one other thing. An AI system can learn nothing if it doesn't have the ability to generalize. And it's able to generalize just purely because of, of mathematics. But it's those cases that don't match that generalization that create the challenges. That's not an area where current AI systems do well. This is an R&D question. It's what we call rare cases or the, you know, kind of the tail um, of the distribution in statistical uh, language. And so that's where AI does not do well. We need more research to help us do better on cases that are not as common, but we care a lot about. And if I can say one more thing that just occurred to me, is that also our sense of cultural expectations and cultural bias are definitely not built into an AI system. If an AI system comes up and says, here is um, a dog, and in fact it's a cat, we think it's funny. Um, if, if it comes up and says, here's a dog, but in fact it's a person, no longer is it funny. And so there's no sense of that concept of cultural um, expectations, of social um, proper ways of, of treating people, no idea of uh, human dignity, so to speak, in these kinds of systems. That's another technical challenge for, for these systems. So Svetlana, I'd love to hear, you, you're a leader in tech policy on Capitol Hill. Uh, you've helped um, run the Congressional Tech Staff Association, the AI Caucus, all of these forums that can bring the technology to the Hill. We obviously have a lot to unpack here, but I want to dig down on one specific issue, which is 
data. Right? Lynn brought up data sets and particularly how they may be deficient in certain respects. And one thing that uh, I've been considering is how that runs squarely against some of the privacy and data conversations that we're having in public policy right now, uh, that to run a fair and unbiased AI system, the reality is we need more data, particularly in certain demographics. Um, but there are discussions uh, and conversations right now that are actively aimed at potentially restricting the ability to acquire said data. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that balance and how you're approaching that? Yeah, I think that that's a really important and critical point. Um, I think on one hand, you know, we're seeing a greater push to be able to flesh out some of the privacy concerns and the need for federal mm -hmm. privacy legislation. And there's a growing concern that people are losing control over the data that they share. And I think on the other hand, um, to be able to have a the larger the data set, I think the more informed, right, the or the the less of a risk for bias from what I understand. So there are definitely concerns that we need to be balancing and that that should be a really critical part of both, I think, AI and the room for biases as well as privacy legislation that we consider. But I think that one of the ge general kind of overarching concerns is that there is uh, this I think opaqueness when it comes to what data inputs are being, uh, that are part of the training data sets that we're not really sure what data is going in. And I think that having more insight and transparency into that process would, I think, address some of the privacy concerns because there's just, with how are we, how are we really able to ensure fairness when we have no idea what information is actually being uh, put into, into these uh, data sets. We're definitely not done with, with data in this conversation, um, but I want to, to pivot a little bit. Um, Bari and I had a similar discussion at, at CES, which I hope some of you were able to, to join us for. Uh, and she got me to consider something that I had hoped that I wouldn't have to consider in, in this conversation, uh, which is... I'm very good at that. <laughs> and, and, I, and I appreciate it, um, which is the issue of, of intentional bias uh, and the unfortunate situation that we may have circumstances that are not accidental oversights. Uh, Bari, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on, on your experience and what's led you to um, believe that we still need to, to have a serious conversation about the potential for uh, the introduction of intentional bias into these systems. Yeah, so I, I respectfully disagree to a certain extent with what you said um, at the end about it not having a cultural component or competency. I think the distinction may be when you point out that there is a cultural compo component or distinction that's missing once you see the output of, of the algorithm and you point it out and say, hey, this is faulty. And if someone just kind of says, mm, but it's based off of what we have. And I've seen that before. Yeah, and what typically happens in a technical solution is that people put in an exception. And so they say, here's an exception. Look at the output and say, OK, is it one of these exceptions that we've learned about? And then check. And so that is not part of the, the standard algorithm. It's once we've learned these, now we have a, se a set of special cases. And so in that sense, it's added on after the fact. It's not part of the fundamental AI algorithm. Right. But the issue with that is that oftentimes, and I've seen this, people do not course correct, or they're not willing to, or it may be costly, or it may require additional data that they don't have. And now we have to go get this data. Well, where are we going to get it? Now it's an administrative burden. And oftentimes, you see people will prioritize their profit over their principles. Um, and, but that's to the detriment of people in marginalized communities who are being affected by these outcomes. And to your point, there's a black box where there is no, there's no real transparency into what data sets are being used or how or by whom and how often. And I think that's also something that we have to be cognizant of because, yes, we do need complete data sets in order to make the technology better. But the issue is now you're dealing with particularly marginalized communities who have a, a distinct fear of how this information is going to be gathered, how it can be used against them. Like, I know people who refuse to do ancestry DNA tests because they're like, nope, nope, the government's going to take my information and sprinkle it on a crime scene, and I, I don't want any parts of that. 
and that's the hard part, is that you have to give people enough information so that they are willingly participating, but you also have to give them data portability options so that if they no longer want to participate, that they have the ability to say, I don't, I don't want to be involved in this any longer. So it's, it's a very delicate dance that you have to do in terms of providing people enough information to make an informed decision so that we make better products, but also allowing them the personal autonomy that if they no longer want their data to contribute to something that they have the option to remove it. And I'll just point out, there's certainly, uh, I'm not a lawyer, I know you are, but um, there are lots of laws that already apply to things like discrimination and uh, business practices that are uh, hurtful to certain uh, populations and um, detrimental to certain groups. And so those kinds of things are not unique to AI. You know, people can have bad business practices across <coughs> the board. So I think that those kinds of practices in general apply to AI but are not unique to AI. They're not, but I would also say the same thing that I tell my clients that I tell my son. A rule is only as good as its enforcement. So if I have a rule but I'm not actively enforcing it or I'm enforcing it with disparate impact or there's, there is not parity across how the rule is enforced and enacted, it's, it might as well not exist. And Svetlana, are, from your perspective as a policymaker, are the rules good enough? Are they being enforced properly? Um, tell us a bit more about sure. where you are with those conversations on Capitol Hill. Yeah, I think that, um, again, following up on this conversation, because we don't, there is a real concern because there's a lack of transparency and there is a lack of testing in terms of before the product's even released, assess for bias, and there is a lack of auditing afterwards to really monitor how the learning is taking place you know, with the algorithms and what effect that's having, it's really difficult to enforce these and things. I mean, it's, if, you, if you don't know what's happening, how can you really enforce against it? And so I think oftentimes we depend on civil rights groups and various um, you know, stakeholders to be able to try to get this information, but it's very difficult. Um, so I, I guess in short, um, there is definitely I think an interest in seeing more transparency in this, and we saw that articulated at last week's um, House Energy and Commerce Committee hearing. The Consumer Protection Subcommittee held a hearing on diversity and inclusion, or sorry, inclusion in tech, and a lot of these concerns were articulated. So definitely more can be done. And I think that inclusion and diversity in tech is a great segue to, to take our conversation uh, in a direction that I haven't heard as many of these AI and bias conversations go. Um, Lynn and, and Bari and Svetlana, of course, feel free to jump in. Uh, when we look at the challenges that are currently being solved by AI, right, those challenges are being identified and solved for by a relatively narrow group of people in our society. Can you talk a little bit about the implications of that reality and what kind of challenges AI may not be meeting because we don't have diverse people at the table? You're addressing that to me first? Yeah, that's, I'm happy to answer that. I think certainly um, we need more people, period, um, in the STEM fields. We have a great shortage across the nation in all sectors, in uh, industry, academia, and government who have expertise in this area. Clearly one source of that extra uh, person power is in the diverse uh, populations, women and underrepresented minorities who are not engaging in this uh, field as much as, as we would hope. And so I think having more d diversity, but simply more people who are trained in STEM areas will provide a, a variety of different perspectives and help us address some of these, these key challenges. Uh, certainly, um, if you have a, um, someone that comes from a different perspective and they're one of the people who are developing and testing these kinds of systems, then they will be more likely to pick up on behavior of that system that maybe somebody else from a different background would not have, uh, have noticed. So I think that can help. I think, broadly speaking, we have a, just a shortage of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is an area in education and workforce training that we need to, to develop as well. And if I can um, get back to Svetlana's point as, uh, on the issue of transparency, mm -hmm. this is also a very tough technical challenge. Okay. It's not easy to say, you know, push a button and have the AI system explain what it's doing and explain how it's come up with its decisions. So this is the importance of investing in research and development to help us answer these questions technically. I think um, there's a, an, an enormous amount of research going on. In fact, an entire conference on fairness, accountability, and transparency that is hundreds of people, researchers, who are coming together to 
look at what are the technical solutions so that we can get around these challenges of bias, of transparency, of explainability. These don't have easy technical answers. Um, and so um, that is another pathway for helping us address these, these kinds of challenges. So that it's not up to the, having good faith that the, the people using the technologies are using them well. If we can come up with technical solutions that sort of bake in these kinds of um, expectations of the characteristics, that's, uh, I think, a, a longer term better solution. But it's still an R&D challenge going forward. I would just add that, yeah, I agree. It's a, it's both a challenge on um, in terms of the pipeline and the diversity in the workforce side and also on the technical side. Um, something that I would add that I thought was interesting that came up to at our hearing is that people oftentimes talk about this as just a pipeline issue. And I think that what's interesting is that what we heard from one of the witnesses was even when folks are getting these degrees, and of course we could be doing a lot more to have in, in terms of the number of degrees and folks that get degrees in this area. Um, um, but that the people that are actually getting the jobs, even if they have the degrees, are not, there's, there's a disconnect. So basically, if at larger tech companies, for example, you are, you know, folks that already are working there are likely to, um, there's sometimes an incentive program for referring other people, and that's it's how people 52, get hired. 52% of people who work in tech are referrals of other Right, employees. and so you're likely to refer people that are in your ethnic or racial circles, and that's one of the problems, is how the, it's not just the educational pipeline, it's actually at the hiring point as well. Yeah, I, so I personally, I hate the pipeline excuse. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just full stop. I just I'm not I'm not a pipeline issue fan. I understand that there are not enough people that are entering these fields, but I also think what people take for granted is the fact that, to your point, if 52 percent of people in tech companies are referrals, I'm going to probably look for someone who went to Berkeley, is a black woman, is roughly 5'10, <laughs> what not. Um, probably not, <laughs> but. But generally, and I saw this even at the, the tech companies that I work in, you're hiring the same carbon copy of a person. Even if it's a black person in J. Crew, it's the same person. They're just brown. And my biggest point is always that it's not that, it is, it's not that there is a disconnect in terms of pipeline. And I feel like I've said this a bajillion times over the last two years, but North Carolina A&T graduates thousands of STEM degrees every year. I have met two people in the Valley who graduated from North Carolina A&T. That's abysmal. There, there are people there. It's just that the companies are not going there because they're not Stanford, they're not Berkeley, it's not MIT, it's not Harvard. And so if it's out of your comfort zone, you're not going. Well, if you want to continue to have the same results that you've always gotten, continue to do the same thing. But if you say you want to make better products, you say you want diverse employees, you have to go where the people are. It's not always if you build it, they will come. They don't want to come. They don't want to come to Palo Alto. <laughs> they want to stay in Atlanta. They want to stay in DC. You have to be able to also put employees in positions where they're going to be successful, not just professionally, but also personally. And so you have to be willing to actually go and step outside of your comfort zone, go to North Carolina A&T, go to Morehouse, go to Spelman, go to Howard, go to these places where the students are there and they're graduating. But for whatever reason, the disconnect is because they can't find them and they're looking for you, but you're, not, you're looking past them. And so the pipeline issue for me is just like DOA. I just, I, I, don't, I don't think that that's necessarily it. I do agree that there's a lack of people in, in STEM generally, but there's also the issue that people do not recognize and look at candidates holistically. So if you are dealing with someone who, like I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I've been an attorney for almost 12 years. I didn't start necessarily in tech. I started at a firm doing tech transactions, but going in house is a different, a different skill set. But you don't have to have a STEM degree to work at Facebook or StubHub in marketing mm -hmm. or in sales. So why is it that someone who has a transferable skill set that might be working at, I don't know, a foundation right now, mm -hmm. why is that not able to be transferred to doing the same type of writing, whether it's copy editing or it's actual content? Why can't that person do that at Facebook? If I did it here, who's to say I can't do it there? It's analogous. So that's another issue is that it's not that there isn't a, a wealth of people and talent, it's that people are not looking at people holistically to see that they can do the job in a different setting. So we're having these incredibly important discussions all over South by at CES uh, in, in our world. So Anna, you alluded a little bit to the fact that these conversations are also coming to Capitol Hill um, in the form of hearings. Yep. 
Give us a sense of where we are on Capitol Hill in terms of, do you have the right information? Do you feel like all of the, the technical and societal conversations are coming to the Hill and fully informing the members of Congress? Mm -hmm. are, are we in a place where we can make prudent policy or do we still need more information? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we had a hearing last week, and the, uh, my boss, Congressman Jerry McNerney, also co-chairs the AI caucus, and that's something we're really trying to do with the caucus, is to be able to bring the conversation to the Hill. The point of the caucuses are more informal organizations, members of Congress. Um, we want to make sure that we use the caucus as an opportunity to educate members, um, to bring technical expertise, to help inform them. We also want to use the caucus as a way to both examine the great opportunities that AI brings, as well as the challenges, and I know the Congress specifically wants to also look at some of the nuances. It's not just one way or the other. It's more complicated than that. Um, I think that, sure, more, more expertise and um, more information would be incredibly helpful. And I know that, um, Lynn, you also spoke on the Politico panel this past weekend, and Congressman Robin Kelly was on that, and she was talking about how members of Congress are really open to hearing you know, about this. It's not that they want to learn. It's just, I think, having this expertise and being able to be informed about what's happening in the space and what companies are doing to address some of these challenges is, is critical. But I do think that we have, I mean, there are certain issues that I think, as we've heard from the consensus on our panel, that we've identified that are, you know, are really important that we can start addressing um, from how we talk, you know, in terms of having folks that are actually creating these pro products at the table um, to be working on them that are the products that are going to serve the, you know, be representative of the community that they're going to serve, to addressing that challenge, um, to addressing the challenge of more transparency in terms of the data sets that are used and more testing of the impact that those are going to have on different populations before a product is released and even after. So I think there's a, I think we have enough information to know where some of the problems are and that we can start working on how to address those things. So we've talked a lot about the big challenges around artificial intelligence, which I think is a very serious and important conversation that we all need to be part of. Uh, we also do want to touch on the fact that these are revolutionary technologies that can do a lot of good. Uh, we did a Twitter poll uh, of people around this panel, and they were most excited about the ways that AI can revolutionize and benefit the healthcare field, for example. There's so many applications in which AI can genuinely make someone's life better. Uh, so contrasting some of the serious discussions that we've had with the potentially life-saving applications uh, of AI, uh, Lynn, I wonder if you could kick us off and talk about, are we on the right track with AI? Are we on the right trajectory? Is it really going to be a life-changing and life-improving technology despite some of these concerns? Or do we need a course correction? So I think AI has application across nearly every sector of society. It's relatively new in the sense that we're now beginning to see products on a wide-scale basis that use AI. Traditionally, we've had AI used in, in areas that weren't so risky in terms of if they had a wrong answer, like a recommendation of a movie that you ended up not liking, you know, you're probably not going to sue Netflix or someone. Um, so the co consequences of prior applications of AI, recommender systems, Google Maps, the Siri rec voice recognition, are uh, not life and death. They're not changing the course of your life kinds of applications. AI is now developing to the point where, particularly because of, of deep learning and the, the focus on all this large digi digitized world that we can learn from, is now being used in some applications that do have more consequences, like what has been brought up on this panel. And so I think what we're still in the in the nascent stages of that really of really learning what the consequences are. We're learning about what are the weaknesses of the technology, and clearly we need to be judged based on how we respond to what we've learned um, about those. And so I think we do need to hold people accountable that once they've learned that this is an unintended consequence of how the AI has been developed, that they respond and respond responsibly and be held responsible if they don't do that. Mm -hmm. But I think we're in a transition period right now now where we're figuring out these 
um, really bringing more awareness to the consequences of being wrong in some of these application use cases. There are enormous application use cases where, um, where those consequences are not so severe. So I think what we need to do is to take a very a focused pers perspective and think within each sector of application of AI, what are those use cases? And the um, executive order that President Trump signed on the American AI Initiative has um, a section in there on having the agencies look at the applications within their sector to figure out what are the implications there as it relates to civil liberties and privacy and safety and security and other um, aspects and then um, address those in terms of all these kinds of issues that we've been talking about, the bias, bias and fairness and explainability and safety and security and so forth. And looking at application by application what needs to be done. Some applications, like I say, don't have these consequences and they can lead to enormous good, like um, improving the productivity of a factory floor might reduce the, pro the cost of many products that benefits us all. You know, maybe if it could have gotten 10% better or, or, or whatnot, it would have reduced it even more, but we're not really aware of the, some harm to ourselves for that. So there, um, if you look about at um, efficient energy usage, for instance, um, there are many, many areas in healthcare that can help us, and it won't be an individual decision that's either life or death, but can help us learn about causes of diseases and so forth. So there are many of these applications, I think, across the, all of society that can have enormous benefit and are having enormous benefit. We just have to be very careful and diligent about these cases where a decision of an AI a tool is being used to greatly change someone's access to resources or consequences, be it um, in, in policing, judicial sentencing, be it access to finances, um, financial lending, be it access to a university, enrollment in a university and so forth. Those are critically important areas that we need to pay very close attention to. But it's not all of AI that needs that um, high attention. So somehow we are already at the end of our discussion here. I want to give Bari and Svetlana a very quick opportunity to weigh in on the question of whether we're on the right track. Uh, and if, if so, what you're most excited about, and if not, quickly what needs to be corrected, and then we're gonna have time for maybe one or two brief audience questions. I would, I would say that I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a both and. Yep. So yes, there are things that are fundamentally good and, and fantastic about the promise of what AI can do. To the point about, you were talking about admissions and credit worthiness and policing, and like personally all that scares the bejesus out of me as a black woman and a mother. <laughs> Um, because to your point about auditing the outcomes and are these correct and are they good, so yes, if that is the rule, what's the enforcement of that rule when you find that something may have negative implications for certain marginalized groups? And if there's no transparency as to what that is, you can decide to solve for that however you want and there's no ramification or there's no uh, ability to call you to the carpet and say, hey, this seems to have a... Uh, disparate impact on this particular group, what are you doing to solve for that? It's like, oh, well, we, we, it's fine, we, we fixed it. That scares me. Um, the other thing that scares me around healthcare is uh, there was a study that uh, used AI to predict cancer in certain patients in New Zealand, and I looked into the study and read it, and it, all of the data sets were on uh, uh, Caucasians. So I would not want that to diagnose me, personally, um, because it's if you don't have a data set that also you know, is taking into account that black women die of heart disease. Mm -hmm. That's the number one killer. We're subject to hypertension. If you don't have those data sets and that information, I don't know that that technology would be able to necessarily solve for my medical issues. Um, but I also think that if it has that data, it has that ability. So it's really just about finding where some of those gaps are and how can we fill them to make it better. Um, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I think it's just making sure that there is the transparency and there is the ability to uh, fill those those blind spots. Mm -hmm. I would just add that I think that there are a lot of exciting opportunities that AI brings um, in healthcare and diagnosis, but there are also the concerns that you raise, um, but the ability to be able to cipher through all this information and you know come uh, have diagnosis, assuming that we have fair data sets, um, which is a big if. But but I think is the promise of that the doctor wouldn't be able to do and as quickly at all, and just like that could be real life saving technology, and that's exciting to me so long as we're getting it right. Um, you know the concerns is uh, this is just echoing what I've said.
said previously, but I think back to, I think, the Congressman's district that we serve and the constituents there that are already disadvantaged and how some of these things could further marginalize them. And that's something that, first and foremost, is something we're really committed to making sure we get right. I think that that's, that could have really you know, serious impacts, and we want to make sure that, that we are moving away from that and not further in that direction. So there are clearly very big upsides to artificial intelligence, um, life-saving, life-changing applications that we are very excited about. There are equally large challenges. Uh, Consumer Technology Association is here and ready to take on those challenges. Uh, and we look forward to working with these partners and others to make sure that we have AI systems that truly are making people's lives better. Uh, I think that we have a chance for maybe one or two quick audience questions. Um, if you could raise your hand, Sasha, with the microphone, I'll go find you um, pink shirt. Hi, thank you. Do you think we need something similar to like an IRB we have for research, something for AI when it impacts human subjects? Sorry, and could you define IRB, please? Uh, Institutional Review Board. So they have diverse sets looking at who you're researching, making sure that you'll do no harm, that it's distributed. Something like that would, you know, should we have something like that for AI to help govern that and um, try and eliminate these biases that we might have because there's just lack of oversight? I, I think so. Um, I think that it, at least you need to adopt that as a best practice. It's funny, I actually wrote an article almost two weeks ago, and I ended it with that I think technologists should have a similar Hippocratic oath that's first do no harm. Like, that should be the goal. Um, I think the other piece to that is you, people are so focused on shipping product that they don't test and, and do their full due diligence to see how something is going to be impacting certain populations before they ship it. And then you're stuck at the end kind of looking at what happened and, and trying to fix it on the back end. If you test it first and see that something is, is not right, then you're saving time and you're actually saving money in the end and you're saving bad PR and bad tweets and everything else. All right, one or two more questions back, um, back left there, blue shirt. Thanks very much. Um, I uh, work for an association that represents the aerospace industry, and we just put out a study this weekend about what our vision for 2050 is, underpinned by AI. But I wanted to ask a question about the workforce conversation that we just had, because it went back to STEM, STEM, STEM. And what 75 of our chief technology officers think AI will do in the future is emphasize softer skills, diplomacy, and kind of take the place of much of those hard STEM skills. And I think there's an opportunity there to reach broader, more diverse um, communities and include those people in this AI future in a way where they can bring more to the table than trying to say, well, you need, a, you need a STEM degree, you need a STEM degree, and you need to go to Stanford, and you need to go to MIT, and then you're basing it on those admissions, uh, those schools' admissions policies. And I was wondering if, if you think AI will change what the workforce of the future is going to look like, or we're going to still have the same conversation that tech has been having about STEM and failing to succeed for most of the last 30 years. So I couldn't agree more that we need a diversity of, of people from different uh, disciplines at the table. Um, when you look at any kind of AI application, you need a domain expert and you need the technologist person there. You need someone who can communicate the impact. You need someone who thinks about the social implications. So I think having people from all those disciplines together at the table is the way to go with all of these. It's not to say that um, everyone that's at the table needs to be a STEM person, but we right now we do have a shortage of people who can understand the technology Technology. My theory, it's, it, which is totally unproven, is that a lot of the challenges we have right now with cybersecurity is that we had a lot of people in the past that didn't really have good training on how to do cybersecurity, and so they were sort of doing it on the wing and the fly, and, and, and we're now in, ended up in the situation we're in, we're in with not good cybersecurity across the board. So I think we do need to have deep technologists that understand the implications of the, the technology and ways that it can go wrong, but clearly we need those folks at the table with all the other uh, folks that we've talked about. And that's, that's going to be the way of the future. I do think certainly as AI uh, develops and has certain kinds of uh, skills that are easy to um, use AI for, that means that we as people with our creative uh, minds will have more role in, in, in those creative endeavors, which is, is critically important. But the AI is not going to build itself either. So it's really all of these together um, will, will help us uh, together as a society and make sure we're making good use of the technology and, and good for society. All right, and one last question. 
All right, well, it still is early in the morning, after all. Um, <laughs>